Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. Uh, for the next 25 minutes or so, I'm going to be speaking with you about the psychology behind mobile behaviors. And I thought, because you're all quite warmed up already, we would start with a little quiz. It's not a particularly heavy quiz, don't worry. So by show of hands, put your hand up if you use your mobile to check the news in the mornings. OK, fuck, that's a lot of people. Uh, watch videos and movies. OK. Uh, text your friends. Use social, you might as well just keep your hands up. Um, get directions for things, buy things, even boring things like insurance. No, you're not, not insurance. Need a strong whiskey and a desktop for that. Um, okay, so essentially, well, or maybe not, maybe that's gonna lower or heighten your, your premium, depending on how much you drink. So we have a problem, basically, and that's that we use our mobile devices for pretty much everything, not just the easy stuff, but even the stuff that would be better executed on alternative devices like de desktops and things. Um, and so when people encounter things like 10 second page loads and they're trying to complete an action which is too complex online, chances are that we're coming up against quite a large challenge. So how can we design more rewarding interactions specifically on mobile that will help people to stay engaged and keep coming back for more? Being that I'm in the field of psychology, I would say that we can optimize mobile experiences by using a certain number of psychological principles. Now, there are four that we're going to go through today. There are a whole bunch of different ones that we can use. Um, there's quite a lot of material, so I'll make the slides available to you in PDF format afterwards. So if you just want to sit and just enjoy it, you can. And everything's fully referenced if you want to dig a bit deeper and be a bit of a geek like me. So we're going to look at cognitive load, processing fluency, hedonic adaptation, and my favorite, dopamine loops. So cognitive load, essentially this is the load that performing any given task places on your cognitive system. Um, and if I was going to ask you to conduct a particular task, it would be the total amount of mental effort that you're spending trying to complete that task. So if I said, okay, you guys over here, would you mind making me a little cheeky cup of tea? You'd say, yes, that's fine, I can do it in my sleep. Low mental effort, low cognitive load conversion completed. If I asked you guys to do my tax return, you'd probably tell me to piss off there's no way I'm doing that kind of calculation because it's too hard. And all of this is to point towards the fact that we have an extremely limited capacity for cognitive processing. And when we're asking customers to engage with us, we've got to make sure that if we're going to encourage conversions, we're lowering the mental effort that we're demanding of them to complete the task. Now, this is especially important on mobiles um, when you consider the way in which we interact with our phones. Usually, we're on the trot, we're, we're running around between trains or what have you. We expect something that's going to be quick and easy and usually have some element of play or pleasure. The difficulty is that a huge amount of research has found that we're using devices in a way that doesn't match up with our expectations. So, some research that was conducted by Ericsson looked at the varying degrees of cognitive load or mental effort across different stressful situations. And they actually found, I'm going to be out the way for this, that experiencing delays on your mobile phone was more stressful than watching a horror movie, standing at the edge of a virtual cliff, watching a melodramatic TV show, or even waiting in line at a retail store. That's pretty damning um, when you're thinking about how we're using this for pretty much everything. So if we're talking about reducing the cognitive load and the mental efforts, when it ends up being, um, resulting in something like this, how can you actually do it? Well, I'm going to start with a couple of examples. Everyone recognizes this store. The first thing that you can do to reduce mental effort is to make it easier for customers to make the choices they're trying to make. Great example here, ratings. If a rating is usually between 3.9 to the high fours on a product, you're much more likely to believe that it's credible and that it's popular. If it's got clean fives, it's going to look a bit dubious. The second thing, social proof. How many other people have taken this action? Is it socially sanctioned as a good thing to do? If yes, you're going to take that choice. The second thing is to reduce the pain of a particular interaction. Research has found that if I pinch you or ask you for a fiver, similar regions of the brain act activate in response to that pain. So if you can reduce the amount of effort and the work that goes into actually purchasing something, you're going to end up with less mental effort and higher conversion rates. Another great example, Bath Store, this is a, a store in the UK. They reduce a painful, complex task, checkout, by simplifying it into discrete, single steps. Step one, sign in, or guest checkout. Once you've completed it, you get a nice little friendly, reinforcing green tick, which is associated with positive results, good work. 
And then every time you finish the single discrete, discrete action, you're allowed to move on to the next. Another example, if you can cast your minds way back to when there was hope and optimism in the world. Oh, Jesus. I'm so sorry. I love you, America, but, well, and we can't talk in the UK. Anyway, let's leave that to drinks afterwards. Opening strong. You're going to regret opening with me. So, okay, so the Obama-Biden website did look like this at the very beginning of the campaign, and a fabulous chap named Kyle Rush was heading up their conversion teams, and they needed to increase the donations. So what did they do? They increased the processing fluency, which we're going to look at in a minute, by lowering the effort required to donate on the page. The, those of you who are sort of quite keyed in will probably already have guessed a couple of the changes. First thing to note, this one, all the information in one page, low contrast, you're looking at the form, you're thinking, oh God, how long is this going to take? This one, nice big image, seems a lot simpler, fewer elements. You've got the image of Obama with a massive crowd, that's social proof in a visual form. His eye gaze is looking towards the call to action, so you're looking at his face, you're bouncing back across. The checkout process, it's simplified into four discrete steps. If you're someone who has um, a need for understanding where you are in a process, and this depends on your culture and your personality, having it spelt out is going to be really um, quite comforting. You also have buttons using the affordance principle. You can just hit any button that you like and give what you want or enter another amount. And what's crucially important, which most people miss, is the terms and conditions. It's massive on this page. It's much longer than the ones that you have on that side. And yet, because we're visually chunking this page into two segments, it feels like it's less overwhelming. So this resulted in a factor of millions of dollars increasing in donations given through the donations page. So if you want to use it, you have to reduce the number of actions required for your customers to achieve the goal, whether it's um, an app, a website, whatever it might be. You can also split complex processes into single steps. Once they've finished one, move them on to the next. And also minimize visual clutter in a way that makes sense by chunking visual elements together. Um, I thought I'd give you an example of desktop versus mobile for this brand. Who knows ShopStyle? Anyone knows ShopStyle? Okay, a couple of, oh, not that many of us. Ladies, check it out. And guys, if you hate shopping in shops, which I hate, this will make your life so much easier. Um, I'm not sponsored, I'm just a massive fan. So here's the website. You've got loads of different things. Call to action at the top, you've got a search bar, you've got all of this stuff that you can buy, or like search through the website, and another call to action. There's quite a lot of things that you could do. When you have limited real estate on a phone, you need to simplify. So you have a tiny call to action, which you're probably not likely to see. You've got the major one at the bottom. And hidden in the hamburger navigation bar, which I always like to think from the top, um, you have all of the other options. So you're simplifying the navigation, making it super simple to decide what to do. And only people who want to dig in will go up there. OK. Second principle is processing fluency. And this is the ease with which people process the information that you're giving them, whether it's content, like marketing stuff, or a call to action on a website. Um, and essentially, content that is more easy to process, which is high in cognitive fluency, it feels nice and fluent, it's much more likely to be perceived as trustworthy because you associate the feeling that we have in response to that content with the brand that's serving it to us. So there are various ways that you can increase the fluency of your content and um, your interactions with your customers. The first is to use repetition. Now, when we see or hear something repeatedly, whether it's a jingle or a call to action, we also tend to rate it as more likely to be true, even if we don't remember having seen it. So even if you say to someone, have you seen or read this statement before? And you have, but you don't remember. And they say, no, I haven't seen that. Because you have that sense of subconscious familiarity, you're more likely to trust the message. And this is why things like repetitive CTAs and phrases and jingles tend to be so much more memorable and also more effective at getting people to convert. Um, so I'm probably showing my age with this one, but who remembers this? Washing machines live longer with calcum. One, one, two, anyone else? Oh, come on, okay, good, thanks, right. Some of us, the dinosaurs, the audience. Fine, and the thing is, that's not interesting. Washing machines live long, longer with calcum. What does that mean? They're not alive yet, they're not like smart machines. But because you put a jingle to it, you kind of go, oh yeah, I remember that, that's when I was little. And you have this emotional kind of sense of familiarity. So these things do actually work. The other thing which is a little bit tricky to use, but when done well can be quite effective, um, is focusing on structure. So if you can create a message whose structure your customers kind of implicitly learn, when they see something that is similar, again, it will feel familiar, and they'll be more likely to process that information quickly. All right, everyone recognize this brand? 
Yeah, okay, so just do it. You don't even have to say it's Nike, you've got the logo. What's fascinating about what they do is that they use this um, processing fluency tool, structure of their message, so that when they create other content, like a pre-roll ad on YouTube, you have an implicit recognition of who it's from. And then it's only at the end whether you have the reveal where the brain kind of goes, oh yeah, I knew it was them. So you can use this quite well here. It's the use of the font, the three words, and the full stop. Very simple, but actually quite effective. You can also incre increase processing fluency by uh, focusing on visual elements and making your interactions with your customers, your interfaces, as clear and uncluttered as possible. Of course, Google is the best example of this. I was gonna try and find another one, but fuck it, you've done it really well. You've got the logo, search bar, off you go. Super clear, super simple, very easy to engage in. The other platform that does this really well is Headspace. Does anyone know the meditation app? Okay, I use it, it's, it's really fun. And they, they basically design, um, they've designed, well, two platforms, one on desktop, one on mobiles, and you get 10 days of free meditations of 10 minutes long, and every time you finish one, it unlocks the next until you have a string of little ticks. On mobile, it works really well, it's a very similar um, kind of journey, and because it's really visually clear where you are in the journey, and uh, what stage you're at, and how to unlock the next bit, and even the little congratulations mes messages are nicely designed, you feel a sense of relaxation with the app, and you're much more likely to return to it and engage. So, perceptual fluency. If your interface is easy to understand, people are much more likely to experience some kind of pleasure with it, and this will probably increase their purchase intention and the likelihood they will return. Okay, now I realize the irony of this particular statement. So linguistic fluency, making something phonologically simple, which is not phonologically simple in itself. If you can use simple language, concrete words, and sans serif fonts to make uh, your message clearer to understand, people will have a greater sense of affiliation to your brand. Okay, Cupid's website, another great example of this. Clear strap line. Join the best dating site on earth. You know exactly what you're there for. And the use of sans serif fonts in um, websites and on marketing and brands is so popular that you end up with some of the largest brands using variants of Helvetica, which is super simple, but again, very familiar, which seems quite curious until you look at the research and there's a huge amount of quite bizarre, I don't, know, I don't know who does this, like looks at fonts, I quite like fonts, but they find that high quality fonts such as these actually boost processing fluency, and the inverse is also true if you want to make people think more carefully, so you're revising for an exam or something, or you want a deeper retention of knowledge, serif fonts or hard to read script fonts will create a greater sense of mental effort, but you don't want that for your content marketing, you want this. You also find that fluent fonts are much more likely to induce a positive mood because they seem kind of friendly. I don't know how the researchers found this out, but they did. It also makes information and instructions easier to process and follow. So this is especially important if you're using something that's gonna give people complex tasks, try and use something like this and it will make things more simple. So if you want to use linguistic fluency, there are several things that you can do. First thing, increase the contrast between the text and the background, classic design principle, easy to read sans serif fonts, simplifying your language. You would not believe how many SaaS services keep everything super meta and abstract, and you read it and you kind of go, well, I've got no idea what that means. Try and keep things as com concrete as possible, um, and then have really direct, tangible calls to action. It will always help. Great example of this across devices, Airbnb. Another sans serif font. On mobile, you have a nice little strap line, super simple. Now, it's curious, their mobile website, which is on the left, is actually much easier to engage with and to understand than their in-app. But at least they're using strap lines and fonts, which are simple. Okay, with me so far? Is this too much, too soon? <laughs> okay. Um, the third principle is hedonic adaptation. And this is when we become accustomed to either negative or positive stimuli, stimuli over time, and our emotional response to that attenuates or changes over time. Um, and I wasn't going to say this, but I will, because otherwise it might be a bit dry. It's the same thing, like, you know, and if, if your brother or your sister or your mate farts next to you and you get up to leave the room and then you come back in, it always smells worse when you come back in because you've adapted to it. Um, and then you just, like, <laughs> so, um, so don't do it. Like, just pin them down and make them suffer and then they'll thank you for it. Or they might not, but, you know. Anyway, over time, you become desensitized or bored with the same thing, whether that's a feature or a concept or a reward, an app, a game, a relationship. The more we're exposed to something, the more we attenuate it. And this is known as hedonic adaptation. Now, 
You'll find that online, you have to find ways, especially if you design products that people use in an ongoing, uh, on an ongoing basis, you'll have to find ways to hack this so that people don't get bored and don't drop off. Who remembers um, this game? And who played this game and secretly really loved it when it came out? Yeah, I did. Okay. Right, so Angry Birds. Oh my god, super exciting. Everyone's flinging these little creatures. Great use of physics principles. Starts out, novelty is high, excitement is high, everyone's playing it. Oh my god, we're all doing it. And then eventually you kind of go, oh, okay, I'm getting a bit bored now. There's other games coming out. And so your engagement with it and your using of it drops off. So what do they do? They bring out a new one. And because it's familiar, oh, it's Angry Birds, but it's slightly with a twist. It's familiar, you trust it, you know what you're going to get, but it's a bit new, so it's exciting and, and novel. Your engagement goes back up. And so they keep doing this again and again to get you into a sweet spot where you're not able to hedonically adapt because you haven't been given the chance to get bored. So what starts off is this kind of curve where you get bored and you drop off, ends up looking a lot more like this. And this is something that if you're creating any kind of interface, you can seek to replicate the, in a way that matches the needs and, anticipation, um, and anticipated assumptions of your audience. So, how do you use it? And there is a big caveat to this, but I'll go through the points first. You can update your product or interface fairly frequently. You can change the layout and structure, as well as the user experience, and make the rewards unpredictable, which we're gonna look at in a sec. Now, the difficulty here is that if you do this in such a way that pisses people off because you're changing the product or the interface too quickly, or it's something that they didn't expect, you're going to end up with people stopping engaging with your product. Um, but there are ways to get around this. I don't know how many of you, put your hand up if you used to use um, eBay when it was a yellow background. So, yeah, okay, so early adopters, this is when people are going, oh, you can't take payments online, it's super risky, it's an online auction. And there's a few of us that kind of went, no, we're going to try it, it's going to be great. And it started off yellow, and then some genius decided, oh, it's going to look a bit better if you make it white. So they thought, fine, we'll make the design decision. They make the decision, turn it white overnight, and there was absolute uproar. People were like, but this is our community. What have you done? You've just ruined the, the, the whole brand. And so they had to switch it back because they had so many complaints. But they really, really wanted the site to be white. So what did they do? Over a period of time, over a course of, I can't remember how many days, it's something in the region of 40, 60 days, they gradually made it slightly less yellow until they ended up with it looking kind of like pale yellow and then they got all the way over to white. And people didn't realize because they were adapting to what they were seeing because it wasn't a contrast like that. So when you're making changes, I would urge you to make small changes and to test the changes that you're making with your audience to make sure that you're hitting that right threshold between ease of use and familiarity on the one hand and novelty and excitement on the other. Now, these devices, uh, these principles work across all devices, but there is one in particular that I think is really quite specific to mobiles, and I would like to ask you what you think these following platforms have in common. We have Tinder, we have the infinite scroll on Twitter, um, and any notification system on any of your portable devices. What do you think they have in common? What do they do to you? Anyone want to guess or not? Well, they all trigger the dopamine system. Dopamine is a neurochemical that was discovered in the 1950s by two Swedish researchers, and they found that it's critical for all manner of things, including things like your mood, attention, motivation, thinking, sleeping, etc. Crucially for us, it also causes pleasure-seeking behaviors. Now, this is really interesting. So, say you get to the end of the day and you think, right, I've done a hard innings, I've learned all this stuff, I need a bit of a treat. Your dopamine system will kick in, and you'll get the urge to seek some rewarding stimulation. So what you do, take action, a couple of glasses of wine, maybe a beer. If you're in Barcelona, it might be a spliff. Your opioid system kicks in, and you feel like you're enjoying it. So you get a sense of satiety. And because you're with such lovely people and you're having good conversations, you can rest in that sense for quite a bit. And you feel like you're getting a real sense of um, more profound reward. However, habitual products actually tend to create dopamine loops. And this is our fourth and final principle. So dopamine gets us seeking reward. And when we seek reward, we get rewarded for the seeking in itself, which makes you seek for more. It's the same thing like when you whip out your phone, you're going on Twitter or Snapchat or whatever it is, and you keep scrolling because you're just not getting enough of a hit, and then that becomes a thing. So imagine that you're in a really boring lecture, hopefully not this one. You think, God, I'm feeling quite bored or frustrated or dysphoric. Your dopamine system goes, I know what, I'm going to seek out some reward. So you take action. You whip out your phone. You go on Twitter, Snapchat, WhatsApp, whatever it is. The opioid system doesn't get a chance to kick in because it's not that rewarding. How much satisfaction can you really get from a few characters in a tweet or like a couple of likes? 
So you don't end up with that sense of satiety, and you, you get stuck in this loop of seeking, in this dopamine loop of perpetual search. So what's happening when this happens to us? And it happens to me too, even though I know about the thing. Like this is why I've turned my notifications off on my phone. Well, there's a few things. The first thing is that we seek more than we are satisfied. And there are a whole bunch of evolutionary ideas as to why this might be. If you get complacent, you're not going to evolve, and you're not going to progress as a species. A lot of um, neuroscientific research around anticipation of reward has found that we have a greater dopaminergic response when we're anticipating something, so imagining about that fabulous holiday or the hot date that we've got or the amazing food that we're going to cook versus when we're actually receiving the reward. Isn't that awful? You're like, this is going to be amazing. And then you go and you think, well, I'm in the Seychelles, but it's really not that great. This is where mindfulness comes in. Dopamine loops are also queued up by external triggers. It's like being in a gambling um, den and you start hearing the cash sounds going and it makes you feel like you want to engage in the behavior. Only in this case, it's not the cash sounds going, it's the notification, it's the ping, or the haptic cue, the buzz in your pocket, or the little icon that says you've got messages. The rewards are usually very small. You get a tiny hit that is unsatisfying and usually unpredictable. And in trials done primarily with animals, this variable reinforcement schedule, where the reward is variable and the timing of the reward is variable, elicits the highest rate of engagement. And it's the same again in gambling. So if you get all of these things together, it's the perfect storm for a dopamine loop interaction. Whatever device you're optimizing for, you have to understand all of these principles, and there's loads more, so that you can create an experience that will, really will drive and engage your customers. The tricky thing is, is that whenever we're designing to persuade, you have to think about how you're using these principles and how it's going to impact the person on the other end, because we're all users at the end of the day. We all use our devices just as the people that are our customers use their devices. And so it's quite a tricky thing to hash out where the ethics of this lies, and I think it's actually a really important conversation to have. And I know that this will look different for each of you, but at the one end, if you're using these kind of persuasion principles to help facilitate a better experience for your customers, where their goals and your goals are aligned, so it's for mutual benefit, I'd say that that's the well, ethical use of persuasion for facilitation, versus if you're using dark patterns to dupe people into doing things that really don't serve them. That's more the manipulation end of the spectrum. And usually, we tend to bounce kind of along here, and occasionally you'll step over. But as marketers, designers, and developers, and people who communicate with and build tools for the people who are buying your products, you're both the architects and the users of all of this future tech and all of our future web. And so I'd like to leave you with this question. What kind of world would you like to build? Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Natalie. So, um, so we've got time for questions. So, Stimulating, provoking. I know I've got lots of questions. There's a few uh, online, but let's see if we can go to uh, to the audience first of all. Anybody? Uh, anyone got a question? I've got a microphone. I'm going to toss you the microphone if you have. Um, anyone? 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 Oh, there we go. Awesome. <laughs> Hello. There we go. <laughs> so talking about manipulation and persuasion, the question is also about ethics, right? So yeah. where do you draw the line yourself and how can you live your, with yourself when you only go for manipulation and dark patterns? Well, that's an excellent question. I think um, typically it starts on a slippery slope. I think no one, I've met very few people that start off thinking I'm going to dupe people into taking a particular action, unless you're a scam artist, right? So I think most people start off by going, I know this will really increase conversions, we'll get more customers, we'll be able to grow our business, hire better developers, etc. And then maybe the boss says, well, okay, well, we're not hitting our targets, we're not getting the funding that we need, whatever, so can we just game the system a little bit, try and get more conversions. And so it ends up being this thing where you think, well, okay, what are the payoffs between actually using these principles in a way that just serves the customers versus making it grow for the business? Um, and so often what I found is that people get to a point where they kind of start tipping into this, into the sort of the dark side going, okay, well, how much am I actually helping people? How many complaints are we getting? And often that's the barometer. That's the first thing to go up is like, well, you know, I, I didn't sign up for a five-month subscription and now I've like with the Sunday Times. Reputable businesses are doing this and you sign up for a 30-day free trial, but you realize that after 15 days, if you don't revoke your credit information, they bill you for the next cycle and it's way more than what you thought it was. Um, so I'd say complaints are a good barometer. Hopefully you don't want to get to that point. And then also if you're uncomfortable, I know you mentioned sort of exciting discomfort, but if it's something that you kind of go, 
if I encountered this from another brand, how would I feel about it? And it's always just that simple kind of reframing can be quite helpful. Um, but it's, it's quite a gray area. Uh, yeah, so I don't have a conclusive answer for that. But I think those two things can help, and they help me to decide. And also clients that are working with people to increase gambling in vulnerable groups, like there's certain things that are just a complete no-no. Yeah. You can tweet to me if you want a fuller answer. <laughs> no, thank you. Nice one, thank, thank you. I'll get you just to hold on to that for a second, if that's all right. Um, so we're going to go online. There's a bit of, quite a lot of popularity. So a question, how could you create dopamine loop uh, with insurance products? So I, um, <laughs> so let me, yeah, let I'm me I'm just going to go back to my flight. Yeah. <laughs> but tell us a bit about. <laughs> Who like, asked that one? You well, you there's a bit to. of support for it. So that's good. So dopamine loops with insurance So I guess, products. or would you want to, or how would you avoid them? Tell us a bit. So I guess low interest products, potentially, what's going on there? How can you influence that? God, you're a tough crowd. Okay, so dopamine loops. <laughs> dopamine loops are about reward. Something as banal, I'm sorry, I'm, I, I'm sure you love your jobs, but something as banal as like doctor's appointments, insurance, pharmaceutical products, things that we need to be able to kind of function well, but we don't enjoy doing, are going to be really difficult to marry up with dopamine loops um, because the, um, the task in itself is not inherently enjoyable. So that kind of thing, I think it's actually not worth trying to do it because it's going to be extremely difficult, but you can use other principles to make things easier. So for instance, um, using things like, um, I guess, aversion principles. If you say to someone, you are losing this much money by not switching insurance, making it concrete and tangible and saying you're losing five pounds today by not switching to our insurance, that's going to be more effective at addressing the problem of conversion and engagement than trying to do something like dopamine loops, which is ill fit with the, the challenge that you're faced with. And this is one of the crucial things with all of the psychological principles that well, you've heard me speak about and that you'll hear other people speak about or you'll read about. You have to use the right tools for the job. Not all principles will function across all industries with all clients. So you have to exercise some caution with it, do your split testing, and then find the right combination. Um, yeah, good question. Nice one. So let me just, I, I just want to check that I understand. So with dopamine loops uh, around not being, if we're never as satisfied as we, yeah. as we want to be, do we want to keep, put people in a loop so that they keep coming back or do we, or is that a dangerous thing to get into? Again, it's the question, who does it benefit? So if you're, right. I mean, yeah, it depends. If you're finding that being in a dopamine loop with something is limiting your ability to go to sleep at night because you're constantly scrolling and your screen's too bright and you end up, you know, getting too hyped up, or you're finding that it's helping you create new habits, like with meditation apps like Mindspace. You can see that they're two very different cases for the positive and negative use for that kind of habitual pattern of engagement. Um, the question is, is it serving the clients or not? And the only way that you will find out is by asking them. Great. Any more questions in the, in the room? Can I grab that back? Let's take that. Any more? Any more? Any more? Come on, don't be shy. There we go. Awesome. <laughs> I like the fact you're not testing my throwing ability at this stage <laughs> of, the, uh, yeah. of the event, which is good. It was slightly bad. <laughs> you, pr you primed them. Um, my question is, what's your take on gamification? And do you fear that if we all try to you know, incorporate gamification at some point, the internet is going to become some sort of no man's land? I think it's already a no man's land. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I mean, we habituate to everything. So first of all, it was kind of... Um, how to use pop-ups on websites, and everyone was using pop-ups. And then it was specific things like, if you don't sign up, then you know, you're not a smart person. All these different techniques. When, you, when everyone ends up taking a particular practice and it becomes standardized, then our response to it attenuates. I mean, it's, again, it's kind of this sense of hedonic adaptation. You know what's, what's being done. However, I think at that point, it's less about the mechanism and more about the value that you're providing through a service. So it could be that you have a shitty service, you're using game mechanics to get people engaged, the service isn't going to stack up, they'll leave. If you have a fantastic product or service and you're using gamification elements which serve to enhance the experience, that's always going to work. The crucial point is having a great product that people want, finding out what their motivations are and designing something that's stimulating and engaging that allows them to achieve their, their goals. And if you've got that kind of ecosystem of, of um, things together, then usually it will work well. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Thanks. All good. Let me take that back. Folks, we're going to leave it there so we, so we can move on. But please join me again in a, a big thank you to Natalie Tanahai. Thank you.